Hello and welcome to Conscious TV. My name is Ian McNay and this programme we have three guests. We have Christine Jensen on my left here, Camilla Carr and John James. And this, this is a programme about trauma, but it's trauma with a very wide picture. And with Camilla and John, they have, they have a very, I'm going to say defined, but a, 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 they went through something very extreme, it's a very obvious trauma. But we're also going to look at trauma on a more subtle level, and Christine works as a trauma therapist, because it's our view on Conscious TV that we're probably all traumatised to some degree. And it's that level of trauma that is a barrier, if you like, to finding out more the wider picture of who we really are, which is our mission, if you like, on Conscious TV. So we've just made a programme with Camilla and John, and they were in a very extreme situation. They were they were kidnapped in, in Chechnya in 1997, held, mm. for hostage, held hostage for 14 months. And so we finished making that programme, but we're going to just start with a brief summary from you, Camilla, of what mm. you went through, so people that haven't watched the first programme can understand how the context of, of where you are. Yeah, OK. Um, well, we, we actually went to Chechnya to help set up a centre for war-traumatised children. And um, after about two and a half months, we were kidnapped and held for 14 and a half months. Um, <laughs> I mean, we, um, when we were actually um, kidnapped, I mean, we were taken from this house and we were um, uh, blindfolded, led away, and we were held in different places, um, mainly cellars or blacked out rooms, uh, for, yeah, for over 14 months. Uh, and we had to find a way of surviving, of course. Now, the first thing we did, we, ha we knew we had to start a dialogue with our captors. And, and we were actually lucky, because one of them, um, the first day we were in captivity, he, he has a little Russian-English phrase book, and he was saying things like, how are you? And we were saying, fine, thank you. Do you like the theatre? <laughs> Great, you know, <laughs> nutty things. But it, it started a conversation going. So we started this dialogue. Um, and um, and then because they hadn't physically harmed us, we started asking for you know maybe some fresh air and light. And they pulled a brick out of the wall, and we had a bit of a light bulb that they pulled down. So we thought, no, we're doing okay here, you know. And they're feeding us odd bits, you know, bread and tea always. Um, and when we were moved to a second location. Um, I mean, suddenly, one day, I was sitting in the kitchen and, and, and one guy grabbed a bread knife and he held, held me and was trying to kiss me and had a bread knife at my back. While I managed to, um, to kind of stare him out. And, um, but after that incident, you know, I had to tell John, I said, my God, they are so, you know, traumatised. We've got to be so careful. From that moment, it was like being on a roller coaster, one day friend, one day enemy, friend, enemy. Um, the one thing we were really keen to do was to look beneath their masks and try and reach beneath their fear and their anger and their tears because they'd been fighting in the war for two years and their families had been killed, to reach that little flame of humanity where we could communicate with them. Um, and that's what we tried to do at every opportunity. We didn't know how long we were going to be there, so also we knew we had to find ways of survival. It was up to us. And we did have, by chance really, um, a lot of tools because we had both done Tai Chi and yoga, uh, meditation, and we started using these to help us keep sane and keep physically as healthy as we could. Um, time went on and unfortunately um, we weren't freed and they would get bored and try different psychological games until it got to one point where a guy actually um, separated us and he raped me. Now, that, of course, that was a huge thing and I, um, I did take my mind away and, and I, you know, I said something like, you can never harm the essence of me or the, my spirit. And, um, and I believed that then and I know it now. But, you know, it still, it's, it means that actually I, I took part of myself away in effect to survive equally as hard for John and unfortunately that went on for quite a few months until I was fortunate enough to have um, a dialogue with him and I actually said no sex no violence and he looked at me and said but you western woman breathe sex 
But then he looked at me again and it was like he'd changed and I knew he wanted me as a friend and he never touched me again. But quite soon after that we were moved to look held by families and um, we weren't physically or psychologically abused but we were held in very, very difficult circumstances. Um, of course we had health problems. We Again, we used our um, healing, you know, sort of calling in healing to, to try and heal ourselves because we had no doctors, of course. And, um, and eventually um, we were fortunate enough in um, a Russian oligarch getting involved who negotiated for our release, Boris Berezovsky. Uh, he actually wanted exile in England, which he now lives in England, so, um, you know, it's, it worked for him as well. So after this huge pressure cooker, finally we were released nearly 15 months out of that cellar. And how was it when you were released? I think the first week you were on a kind of a high and then reality oh. set in, didn't it, in terms of what had mm. been happening to you for that time? Yes. Mm. Well, I think I... <clears throat> well, it's probably a known thing, but I call it champagne cork syndrome. And it's like, you know, you're released from this thing and you're flying and you're having a great time and everything's great. And then, of course, the fizz runs out and you come back down to ground with a bit of a bump. And then you then you have to start dealing with mm. with life and how how you are in the in the world you know, sort of, but we had been away essentially removed from the world for well over a year so it's like it, it's, it was going to take it was mm. it did take us quite some time to reintegrate back into our own culture it was mm. really quite bizarre okay we're going to move to Christine now and just hear a little bit of her background and just and I know you had some quite strong, when you were young, you had some quite strong spiritual experiences. Just very briefly, just give us a background to, to how your childhood was in terms of that. Ah, well, when my mother was pregnant with me, about, she was probably about six or seven months pregnant with me, she had a, a fall. And at the time, we lived um, very remotely in the outback in Australia. And uh, in, in a place there was no telephone, there were no um, lights outside, there weren't even roads. And she was on her own. And she started hemorrhaging. And we had a faithful old, old Kelpie dog called Paddy. And uh, she tied a note to the dog's collar and sent him off to the nearest neighbour, who was about a mile away. And, um, and he ran the whole way, apparently, and the doctor came. And um, my mum was OK, and obviously I was OK, and I was born. But I, I do feel there was some kind of, in that experience, um, when I was born, I had a, a very strong connection. I felt I had a very strong connection with spirit, or with something that was much greater than myself. And um, when I was about four, I remember going to kindergarten, and uh, when I'd come home, when I was in bed at night, I would lift my hand up to God, and I would, I would pray and hope that God would hold my hand. And I can't remember, actually, if he ever did, but I know that night after night, I would, would try to do this. And some nights, I would actually tie my dressing gown cord to the bedpost. And I think, well, if I mm. just hold it high enough, one day, God, or one night, God will touch me. And when I'd go to kindergarten, I'd think, well, I wonder how all the other kids do it. <laughs> you know, how do they get there? And I never asked anybody. But I actually see there's a connection, and I don't understand it entirely. But I do understand the connection between almost dying, or in fact my mother almost dying, and the sense of, I know what it's like to go home, in, in the mm. greater sense of the, mm. of the word. So luckily enough, I think, um, plus I was a kid, I was an outdoor typical Aussie kid, I was barefoot most of the time outside, and um, mm. had a very strong link with nature, I spent a lot of time outside. So um, I had this innate understanding that there was something far greater than ourselves and there was something no matter what happened on some level we would be okay and we were loved simply because we are and I think that's certainly um, been a huge support in the work that I do having knowing that somewhere underneath that we're all loved you know we're all held mm. Mm. Uh, and then you had your own quite uh, dramatic trauma oh, yeah. when, 
just <laughs> running through the story briefly of what happened with you and Bevis and you saving, saving up money to, uh, to build a trauma centre and you lost yeah, it all. Well, that's, that was a real irony. Um, we, we had sold our individual houses, pulled the money, and at the time there was a lot of trouble with the banks. Um, people, I mean, even now, of course, people don't trust banks so much, but at the time we didn't know where to put this money. One of our aims was to actually set up a trauma centre for people um, and eventually get a trust fund to help um, pay for people who couldn't pay for the work that they needed. So anyway, we put all this money into an investment scheme that was sold to us as an ethical investment scheme. And um, it turned out to be a big Ponzi scheme. And we lost everything. So it wasn't even money, just savings that we'd had. It was actually all our money that we'd had, you know, built up over our lifetimes. And um, uh, that was very interesting. I mean, having six kids between us, Bevis is a, a younger, so, and they're more dependent on him. But it, it hits you, looking back now, it hit me or it hit us on the level of survival because obviously we need money to survive. Mm. And we actually thought, oh my God, there's a real possibility that we're going to go bankrupt. And, you know, we don't own a house and, you know, what are we going to do? So um, looking back, ironically, you know, being a trauma therapist, um, even then I didn't realize how, actually how traumatizing it was. Um, it's only in retrospect when I look back that I can see that it was. Well, what's interesting, I'm just realising, is that you were wanting to build a trauma centre yeah. and work from that and something happened, you lost the money and you got yeah. traumatised yeah. and you were going to Chechnya <laughs> to work with traumatised children, you were kidnapped and you end up extremely traumatised. So okay. it's, that's quite interesting, mm. that connection there. And also just throw in also, we didn't realise until we all got together, that you, because yeah. you originally come from the Bath area, you live yeah. in Bath, yeah. and you actually worked on the help, worked on the campaign to release these guys when they were... Well, I was yeah. on the periphery, but I yeah. certainly turned up to all the events. Mm. And I didn't know you guys at all. I mean, I'd never met you, but in, in the campaign, I felt a link with you, and uh, um, it certainly kind of brought the community together. Um, so that, that was very funny to, to kind of see you and think, oh, I know these guys. <laughs> and you look at me and think, who's she? <laughs> <laughs> so let's go in a little bit more detail and we see. We haven't got actually a plan where this program goes. It's experiment to see, to see where it gets guided, if you like. So, so you realise after a week or two that actually it's going to be quite a challenge now. You had the challenge of, be of being held in captive, and now you have the challenge of dealing with freedom again. Mm -hmm. So I know with you, Camilla, you almost went, you wanted to write a book, which yeah. I should have shown earlier, The Sky is Always There, which you wrote together. Um, yeah. But actually, you ended up just lying in bed, I think, for a month, didn't you? Yes, it was after about six months, and I did want to write, but I realised then I had, n mm. you know, my um, stamina was crashed, basically, I had nothing. I was standing in boots, and <laughs> something felt really muddy and tearful, and I had to get out. And I, um, I, yeah, I had to lie down for about a month, and that was when anger came up, anger and tears, and um, didn't have the energy to go out. But eventually it wore off, and, and I started writing in bits, but also even in the writing, you know, I had pain in my chest, things came up because of the nature. I knew, uh, you know, I, I did go and have my chest checked out, but it, it was just simply the trauma coming off. Mm. So you, you physically felt the trauma in your mm. chest? Couldn't breathe and yeah. pain in my chest. Mm. And is that um, something that you can connect with in terms of your work? That the yeah, very much so. I think um, I see a lot of people, well, for all kinds of trauma, but, it, you mm -hmm. know, it basically, no matter what the situation, um, trauma is, is something that, that is held in the body. So um, uh, when people are traumatised, they, they, I mean, there are thousands of different symptoms that they can have, um, but one is definitely, well, it will affect the physiology and, and very in varied many ways, but you know, this is this this is definitely one of the kind of symptoms of PTSD. Yeah. It's it's um I'm only thinking it's a bit ironic really, but you know, I know that, you know, what why we work with the kids with lots of movements and everything was mm -hmm. because um because it's in your body and you want to yeah. try and shift it out. But when I came out, because we'd used Tai Chi so much and it was so close in a way to the horror. Now, I just wanted to distance myself a little bit from it. Yeah. And just, um, I mean, I didn't think of it like that. But, you know, I just 
didn't feel I had the energy really to do mm. it. I just wanted to to rest. But you know, and um, I mean, over the years, because of course it like it's like layers of onion, isn't it? It's mm. not just one time. You might mm. other symptoms come up and go. But anyway, you just had to flow with it. <laughs> mm. And you had this mantra thing. come up. You mentioned the book: stop, stop, stop. Like everything was telling you to stop. Oh, at that time, yes, yes. absolutely, absolutely. Because, John, you know, what, what was the main the main symptoms you noticed uh, early on when you got back? Um, <clears throat> actually, I think one of the first things that where were we? There was a couple of things. Actually, was one thing that's just come up just now that came to memory is actually when we did actually started writing the book, and I didn't really want to go there because it was still a bit too tender for me. You know, it just brought up too much strong mm. memory. Mm. And so um, I would actually read maybe a paragraph or several paragraphs that Camilla had written. And we were really lucky. We were living up in North Wales at the time. We had the mountains on the back doorstep. So I'd take out a couple of pages and I'd walk off with a, a you know, recorder and uh, record my voice to actually speak my bit. And I remember this one particular day I got back to the house and I was, maybe I was, you know, we actually had a computer then. <laughs> back in the days, uh, and I was starting to write it, and um, I was reading through a bit that I'd written or, or spoken about, and I just heard this sound in the background, and it was actually the sound of a rubbish lorry reversing, you know, that siren. Mm. And just for a second I was really, really confused, and then I realised that I was so deep into that memory, but in that memory there wasn't a rubbish cart reversing. And it was I was in two places. I was in the deep in this memory, but then this where I was in time and space here and now was this rubbish got connected. And now that really I said, Wow, that's how, how strong a memory is that you can mm. take you away from this place. Mm. And then I guess the next occurrence of like realizing how much trauma I experienced was um we were in Bath, we were uh, living at Camilla's mum's place and it was night time and I just had so many thoughts and emotions tumbling over in my head and it was really unbearable and I actually pushed up the window and screamed help out of the window uh, as uh, almost like the scream I did when I was in captivity I just had so much stuff mm. going on in my head I just needed to s shout for help and then um, I just felt that I wasn't getting any help anywhere, so I just took off and I thought, oh, I know who I'd go and see. And they, but they were in Scotland, and to get to Scotland, I needed to go to London. So I hitched my way all the way up to London, mm. missed the coach. You know, I had to wait several hours for another coach, and then I just walked around London, um, central London, quite late at night, hoping to get the, the night coach, and then ended up talking to people who are living on the street and I think just talking, mm -hmm. connecting with them and hearing their little bit of their rough story and seeing how you know rough they were it's just sort of like kicked back into me so you know after about 24 hours I was said I managed to hit my hitch my way all the way back to Bath again sort of mm -hmm. like feeling a little bit lighter but obviously realizing that I had to had quite a way to go so and let's go back to you and, and you're mm. trying to keep it as much as experience mm. as we can. Mm -hmm. So for you with your experience, okay, you've lost basically the security of your money, which was going to give you your home as well as well as your workplace. Mm. How, what, what kind of physical symptoms did you feel you had at the time? Did you feel in your body? Okay, well that's an interesting question. I um I went into a bit of a freeze state. Um, a freeze yeah. state. Okay. So basically when uh, when we're threatened, when we have a, a life threatening event. We've got three choices. We can go into fight, flight, or freeze. And so how let's get this clear. So yeah. fight is where you're yeah. fighting what's yeah. happening. Flight, like what John ran away. Run away. Yeah. Yeah. And freeze yeah. is you do nothing. Yeah. You just, yeah. yeah. And freeze Stop. happens when um, flight or fight are not possible. It's interesting. Women tend to go into freeze more than men. And mm. I, I mean, there's lots of reasons for that. But um, partly because we're not... Um, so in touch with our instinctive natures so we don't get into the fight and flight as easily as say wild animals who have similar nervous systems to us they get into the fight and flight quite easily if they get into a freeze they shake it off and they're okay 
Um, but I went into a, I thought, oh my God, what are we going to do? And I kind of shut off a bit and um, I felt a bit disconnected, which is a symptom of freeze. It's a bit of a dissociated state, you know. And mm. my sense of actually feeling okay in myself or being able to connect to other people was, was hampered. Um, whereas Bevis, you know, he got into the, he got into a good fight response. Mm. I think anthropologically, men probably, I don't know if you, you found this um, in your experience, but men will often get into a fight experience because anthropologically they're the ones that will go out and do the hunting and the killing. Um, and the women have tended to stay home and kind of be more passive. So women will tend to go into a free state more easily than men. But anyway, he got into, um, okay, we've got to get more into the workplace and I've got to do what I can. I've got children to support. Um, mm. And he got out there and it's, it's like he used that energy mm. Mm. in a sense. And I, I kind of, you know, I kind of went into myself a little more. But eventually um, I started to, to move through it and I thought, okay, come on, we've, we've, come on, harness your resources and, um, and let's get going. And it's interesting that I think in a way it gave us an opportunity or certainly gave me an opportunity to be more resilient and to be more capable part because we had to, <laughs> you know, we just had to. So when mm. you guys were in mm. captivity, you couldn't do the fight yeah. because that would have probably got you shot. Exactly. Yeah. You couldn't do the yeah. flight we knew you couldn't that. get out. Yeah. So it's yeah. a kind of, I guess, a freeze yeah. response. You yeah. Absolutely. And you had to, and that's what, where we used the Tai Chi and the yoga and everything mm. to unfreeze yeah. all the time, every day. It was, Important. And, and did you feel that? Don't. Did you feel that that physically you were unfreezing? Did you notice it? Oh yes, you, you unwound, didn't you? I found it. Um, I mean, I was going through the motions, and I'm not sure how to what degree I unfroze. Um, I was certainly mm. aware that maybe you know again uh, the instinct thing. That the instinct for me has has always been go. I'm I'm a go person. Mm. Um, yeah. Maybe it's Gee. my. Uh, gender as well, but I'm certainly a get up and go. So the, the fact that I couldn't fight and the fact that I couldn't run, and I was a darn good runner, um, was just hard work. And I knew I was sitting on the anger, mm. the fight. Mm. And uh, yeah, it was, it was tough just being, and it was really quite difficult not slipping into freeze as well. You know, sort of logging off as it were, sort of like slightly Numbing out, I think, is, is I think it'd be a way to describe it. It's actually a slight numbing sensation, sort of like you desensitise yourself okay. a little bit because um, maybe because those areas are overloaded. I'm not sure. Well, let's go back mm -hmm. to you, Christine. What actually happens with the nervous system when, when we? And I'm not just talking about extreme cases, mm -hmm. but all of us. I said earlier in the program have a degree of trauma. So what is happening? It's being held at the no, go through it in your words, okay. what, how it works. So, uh, I mean, maybe I'll take an example of wild animals because they have a very similar nervous system to us. So say you've got a tiger that is chasing a deer, for example, and the deer goes into um, a fight and flight. So, as we've said before, it, you know, it's got a choice. It mm. could turn around, maybe fight the tiger or run away. Um, if those choices aren't going to work, it will then go into a freeze state, which is kind of what you've been describing that, that you went through, I suppose. Um, and at that point, um, well, it's, a, it's a very clever survival response because in a freeze state, um, a lot of chemicals are, are produced, a lot, a lot of opiates that mm. actually numb the system so that they can't actually feel. So if that deer was then into, well, there's a term they call playing possum. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's a similar kind of thing. But then the tiger might come up and say, oh, okay, I, this, this is dead meat, you know, and it might have been mm. hanging around for a while, so I won't eat it. Or it may eat it, in which case um, the deer's not going to feel anything. Mm. Um, mm. So, so a lot of us have actually, well, certainly most people I work with, and I think, you know, when you said before, Ian, about most of us are, have some kind of trauma in us, I think a lot of us are in that kind of slight free state because, unlike wild animals, we're not in touch with our instinctive natures so that we don't, when the attack's over or the threat's over, we don't shake it off like a wild animal will do. So say, for example, the tiger doesn't eat the deer and runs off. Mm. Then after a few moments, the deer will get up, 
shake it off and be perfectly okay. So in, in other words, the whole system, the whole physiology, the whole nervous system has come back to an equilibrium state. And that deer can then go off and play with other deers or eat grass mm. or do whatever it was doing before and have no effects of PTSD. Mm. But us human animals, um, because we've become so civilized and we've <laughs> lost our, um, our sense of, of, of our bodies and um, our instincts, then we override these kind of natural reactions. So it kind of builds up. And, um, and also one of the effects is that we, we tend to lose the ability to really connect with each other and with ourselves mm -hmm. or to, to actually feel that the world is a safe place. So how is it for you guys connecting with people after you came back from captivity? Did you feel that your relationship, people that you'd known before, did you feel your relationships just took over from where they were or did you, did you relate with those people differently? Well, for me, I think, it, no, not really. I didn't relate to them differently. I mean, obviously, mm. I, um, um, I've been through that experience, but as far as I was concerned, I was still Camilla. <laughs> and, I wasn't, you know, and they were still who they were. And they'd, obviously I could feel the trauma of our family, because they'd been through trauma, it was a huge, of course, because, of, you know, the whole situation. And, I mean, that, that was quite hard, you know, seeing the, the, you know, the weight loss on, say, my mm. mother and, and sister, and, um, and the shaking. But they also, I could feel their strength and their resilience, which was really, Good. And our sons were pretty amazing. I mean, my son was 11, 12 when we came out, and John's son was 18. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I remember Ashok jumping into my arms, and I just said, how do you cope? And he said, well, of course I cried, Mum, but then I got on with my life. You know? yeah. <laughs> and I just thought, yeah. But it's a very typical, you know, it's an easy response, but I could feel this, this cage around him that he had built. And um, I took him to... Um, an acupuncturist who's very um, intuitive, and he just played with his thumbs beneath, behind John. I mean, Ashok's chest, and Ashok burst out laughing, and he laughed and he laughed and he laughed, mm. and he was okay. He's okay. he talking yeah. about it's like the the animal shaking it off, and the young mm. children. Mm. I mean, I think Ben, it was more difficult. Yeah, know? Ben was yeah. actually at university. This is your son, my yeah. son Ben. Uh, he was at university then. Um, I guess luckily, in many ways, he was actually doing drama. And so he did have a, mm. a good support group around him, even though I think uh, they maybe didn't always understand where he was. And he did get involved in the campaign quite a bit as well. But he did say to me he felt like he froze. He, he mm. numbed out mm. for mm. some time. He That's actually right. felt mm. that. He felt he went a bit numb. But I think he's doing pretty well now. Yeah. Okay, nice. Yeah, you, you also, I, I found interesting was that you had a visit from uh, John McCarthy and Terry Waite are quite famous because yeah. they were held hostage in Beirut for about three years, I think. More than that. Was yeah. it more than that? Yeah. yeah. Five, yeah. And, and, and Terry Waite was, um, was saying to you that when, when you held hostage for quite a long time, it's like coming out of a deep sea dive. And mm. this, it's imperative, this period of adjustment. Mm. It's, you just need the body and the nervous system and the mind, everything, to take its time. Yes, he said something like that. He did. Do. Yeah, it's definitely yeah. like yeah. a de decompression. Mm. And, <clears throat> uh, and I guess an onion is another one, isn't like You know, you, you peel off one layer and you have a bit of a cry and you feel great for a while, but then you've got another layer to peel off and then you have another cry. So mm. it's a sort of a, an, an unfolding, you're peeling off those layers of, of... And I guess that's how it works as well. I'm not sure. You know, as, as the trauma hits, you put a bit of a layer on to protect yourself. And then if some more trauma hits, you put another layer on and you mm. get more and more... Isolated, insulated, isolated from the world. Mm. Yeah, I think um, I think from my own experience over the years, though, it's it's like I have to be really tender with myself because actually, I will all be always be traumatized by what happened. And um, I remember going to a healer, and she said, "Camilla, you'll always have a war wound," you know. And and I kind of took it on, but I didn't really take it on then. That was quite a few years ago. But having um, had cancer for many years now, so that's another thing I just deal with and have to live with. But, you know, and I could give myself so much stick. And I know that, you know, I could think, God, why didn't I do the smile more? Or the, you know, all these tools, you know, and I came out and I just wanted to go, oh, just 
you know, I just want to leave that for a bit. <laughs> just, yeah. But um, just drawing back, I think coming into that stillness, though, that is really important for me. Well, you mentioned the word stillness, and I can feel it in the studio yeah. now. <laughs> Something is much more mm. still, and I guess, I guess that's one of the keys, isn't it, in trauma? People starting to allow themselves to feel their stillness. Um, yeah, it can be. Yeah, um, and of course, for you know, for for a lot of people, they can't. I mean, for some people who are so traumatized, they can't even be with themselves. You know, some people can't even say be in their own bodies because the body. Um, say through abuse or neglect, um, the body then becomes an enemy. So, um, so the work can be, you know, we have to take it at an appropriate pace and take it kind of slowly in order for people to actually kind of feel their way back into who they are on all levels of their being, really. So what, what are kind of suggestions you can, you can make to people? You're working with people that come to you for releasing trauma every day. So. What, what are the main things in common that really help people? Mm. Well, I mean, you know, going back to our deer and, our, and the tiger, um, the language of, of the animal brain, which is where the fight, flight, freeze is held, um, the language of that part of the brain is sensation. Um, so in other words, through the felt sense, what we're feeling in our body, um, we can't really get to grips with trauma or release trauma through the cognitive brain. It has to come through the, the, or the doorway, if you like, the language is through sensation. So I would encourage people to build up um, very slowly, or maybe not so slowly, um, uh, that kind of muscle of the felt sense, you know, what they're feeling in their bodies. Um, and of course, you know, one of the, the top of the list things is, is the need for safety, that, that, that people need to feel that they're safe and they're okay and, and for some people who are very deeply traumatized we may even uh, you know take a few sessions where they're okay there's the door okay and there's a window and mm -hmm. I can get up and I can open the door and I can sit down again so that, that their own sense of autonomy um, which has been so damaged then can come back but yeah safety um, play you know I love the mm -hmm. idea that you guys are working with um, um, art therapy, yeah, is that right? Or, or play therapy? With the kids. So, with the kids, yeah. yeah drama, yeah. art, music, everything. Yeah, it's <laughs> wonderful. Yeah. So the sense of getting into the body and, mm. and, um, and connection with things. You know, I'll often say to people, um, I give people homework, you know, sense the, mm -hmm. the feeling of the shower on your, on your skin, you know, kick your shoes off, feel the earth, you know, have this connection and sense with nature. Uh, very simple things. I mean, trauma by its very de definition, everything happens too fast, too quickly, too much, um, and, and that's part of the overwhelm. So in the healing of it, we need to, ah, oh, we need to slow things down, and allow the system to settle in its own way. And of course, we know that um, we have a we have a, a self-healing mechanism within us. You know, our bodies want to heal. <laughs> they want to regulate and they have an innate capacity to be able to do that. So, I mean, telling people that, hang on, you can actually get through this. You can come back to a, mm -hmm. a sense of equilibrium and our natural state is one of, of thriving, you know, not, not just surviving. I could go on and on, but... <laughs> <laughs> oh, <wait. laughs> oh. Actually, there's a... Are you talking about that? It was a, there's a... There's a film called The Shawshank Redemption. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's a scene Amazing. in there that just... It, it's actually one of the last scenes in the film, which is two and a half hours long or whatever. But there's a bit where he, he's been in prison for 25 years and he breaks out through the sewer and he comes out and it's raining. And he stands there and just feels the rain mm. on his body because he's been indoors for 25 years. Mm. And I... I just really enjoyed the rain, mm. as long as it's not too cold. But um, it's, it's again, you know, it's that that thing. It's that, and then it's just a sensory thing, bringing you back to your body is just like, hey, this is great. Mm. And I remember several years ago, f seeing people running around in the rain like this, and I go, well, actually, it's a blessing. Why not just mm. allow the blessings to fall on you and relax? And they don't get anywhere near as wet. And I get blessed a lot. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Are we 
I would guess that when you're shut away mm. for that time and you there's so little that you actually have in terms of you don't have the sunlight, you don't feel the rain, you don't have decent food a lot of the time, you haven't got a comfortable bed, all these things are taken away. It must come also when you get back home again, tremendous sense of appreciation, the things mm. that a lot of us take for granted. Definitely. But sadly that goes, which is a bit, you know, because I think it would be good to have that sense of appreciation mm. all the time, because we're so lucky. I mean, but I do remember it very well. Everything. I remember the first, when, well, we could hardly sleep the first night, could we, and getting up really early, going out and picking apples up. Now, I mean, apples, to me, they're my favourite fruit. So, you know, I was sort of, and sort of biting an apple, and the sensation of that was your, amazing. Your story about the first sunset was, I found, really, really moving, just after you got released and you were standing on the balcony. Oh, that's right, sunrise. Yeah. The oh, sunrise, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, no, I, it's another time I will never forget seeing that sunrise. Yeah, we do very quickly yes. get into you know, the water comes out of the tap, the, mm. the light switches on when you press a button. and. Mm. But we've really learnt a lot, and I think that's something that actually is probably a good thing to say about trauma in a way, is that mm. we learn a lot through it. Mm. You know, it's, it's, it's part of life, really. Mm. I think we all have our... We all go through trauma of different levels. And it, I mean, I'm not saying that it's important to deal with it, because it is important to deal with it, but, but also to see, what am I learning here? You know, what's... what's uh, where's this taking me in, the, in exploring mm -hmm. myself or how I am? Yeah, it certainly builds up the, um, the capacity and the resilience in our whole systems. Um, and I think in, in the case of when we lost our, all our money, um, and I thought, you know, at the beginning of it, well, that, okay, that the whole idea of the clinic goes out the window. Forget about that mm. one. And somehow, um, you know, without any financial backing or help, we, we managed to get it up and running. <laughs> and now it's doing it. And I look back and I think, actually, I really agree with you on that one, mm. that um, I, I became more capable and more resilient through the money loss, through that trauma. Um, so there is that, definitely there is that yeah. opportunity. Yeah. yeah. Do, do, do you feel, you, you were saying earlier, Camilla, that you still feel traumatised in, in certain ways. I mean, that, it's, it's hard to put your finger on it. I mean, it's... Um, I mean, sometimes I really do think, you know, is there something I haven't deeply looked at? Is there some anger that I'm still holding somewhere for me, to, for this cancer to, you know, embedded itself? Or, you know, it's like, that I can't release it. Because as you say, you know, really your body wants to be healthy, you know, and then you think, oh, yeah, I'm not, but I don't know. And, um, but I, I think also, um, I don't know. I mean, maybe there is. Maybe I just have to ask, you know, just ask the universe, look, if there's anything I need to do, you know, whether it's to sing to the heavens or, to, or you know, screech to the earth, um, then be shown that I can do it. Mm. And you, John, how, how do you feel? Do, 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 you, do you feel you've, you've moved up, moved on from most of the trauma now? I'd like to think I have. Um, I think I'd say that um, for seven years I worked, I worked with, a, with a guy and uh, we didn't have the greatest of relationships working and he pressed my buttons quite a bit because we were different, totally different people and I think he was acting as like a mirror because he was like almost like the opposite to me so he was acting as a mirror and, and pressing my buttons and that I could... I could learn from that. It was painful at the time, and I would sort of react, react to the whatever he said or whatever he did, and I thought, well, that's not a very nice way to. I wouldn't behave like that, and it sort of took take a few days for me to process it and mm. understand the lesson that was being presented to me that was feeling so uncomfortable. So I'm hoping there's no wood around to touch. 
Uh, but, uh, <laughs> a bit of secret. Um, it's been quite a few years since we came out of that you know, mm. that deep dive. Mm. Yeah, sort of hopefully of sort of getting to close back to the surface, or mm. if not on it. And and is that? And maybe I might ask you a question. It's not a fair question, but. Mm -hmm. Does that mean you see reality in a wider picture? Insofar as, do you have a deeper understanding of who John is through that? Wow. Possibly. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, because I'm at this point. Yeah. It's one of those things, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember, I mean, what can I say? I mean, I've actually said the only thing I can relate to that is that people have said, wow, you know, you know, talk about that our story has been he held captive. Well, actually, that was just a chapter in my life. And I didn't have life before that. And mm -hmm. other crazy things happened in that life before that time. And, you know, and maybe not quite such crazy things. Maybe I've learned to manage it differently, but not so many crazy things have happened after. But, uh, uh, oh, I, I like to think I'm a little bit wiser. You see, I picked up on that because you actually say in the book that you did, when you were in captivity, mm -hmm. you spent some of the time, because you had a lot of time, that's the thing you yeah, said, yeah. and boredom yeah. was the greatest enemy, not only for you, but mm -hmm. for your captors as well, mm -hmm. and what might they do with the boredom. But you used to actually spend some time working through the trauma of your previous relationship <laughs> while you're in captivity. So we did. Here you are in trauma situation, you're working through yes. historical trauma. Yes, and I can't remember, we did have a bit of fun with there. I think we, I sort of, sort of, well, I don't know if it was psychodrama, but we sort of, sort of took the mickey out of stuff. Yes. And, um, there were a few situations when we sort of just started playing games with words and just mixing them around and maybe mixing some swear words in and cursing at people, you know, it's just, I don't know, was it releasing that, that trauma from the past, like you said, we were in a, in a crazy place already. <laughs> maybe that's what... It's it, quite helpful, though, I think, mm. really. I think it was helpful. Because you suddenly realise things that you take so seriously, you know, and that you've actually hung on to. You don't need to hang it. You know, it doesn't exist. This, this mm. thing that's in your head of some past situation, you can just actually put it down. <coughs> D does mm. does everyone, do you think, get value from from looking at the possible trauma in their life, or is it is it very is it difficult for some people to see insofar as it's not necessarily obvious to obvious to spot? Mm. I think um, I think people will have particular symptoms um, and that will show you if you are actually carrying trauma energy you know for example as I mentioned before the, the, the inability to connect with others or the inability to feel safe um, it can, obviously it can be lots of physical symptoms too um, things like ME, fibromyalgia are often trauma related um, um, all kinds of I mean um, insomnia um, IBS, uh, you know, the, the, the list can go on. Mm. And so pe people who've got those kind of symptoms that may indicate there's a trauma. But if you start working through the body, then um, the body doesn't lie. So whatever's kind of held there, um, it will show itself. Um, so what you're saying is all the emotional things, well, not all, but a lot of the emotional things have happened to us are held in the body, and we may not be aware of that. Mm -hmm. They're held as a memory, somehow there, and the, what the trauma is going to do, is that, is that, does it release the memory, or does it re release the energy of the memory, or both? Well, if you're releasing trauma, I mean, certainly the way I do it, if you're releasing trauma, you, you go through, um, through the body, and um, through sensation, and that will show you where there's blocks within the body itself. Um, but then, of course, that will show you um, emotional holding, um, psychological holding. Um, so you're obviously then working with the entire being, the gestalt of the whole person, but you're, you're doing it through the, the language of the animal brain, which is, is, is mm. the body and sensation. So um, somebody may come, you know, somebody may think I was definitely traumatized about something, 
and you work through the body and they think, actually, I wasn't. Or, or an event that um, may have seemed, uh, you know, like a very, very small car crash, for example. And somebody says, well, you know, I've had whiplash for three or four years, but I don't understand because it wasn't a big accident. Um, and then you start working with them and you think, and they, they realize, actually, this is trauma. So mm. the good news is that, that if you're doing it through the body, um, you tend to find things out pretty quickly. Mm. I have a question then. Is, yeah. uh, uh, and you've been working with that. Have you ever experienced it or had someone experience? Uh, they said they've had trauma and they wanted to work with it, uh -huh. but it's just been too intense for them. Maybe they sort of re -tra almost re-traumatised yeah. as yeah. they've yeah, to, to, like, to, like, decompressed, they've to come up yeah. and had to... Yeah. That's a really good point, actually, yeah. because um, if people are traumatised, they're already overwhelmed. Yeah. So um, cathartic stuff generally doesn't, in my experience anyway, it doesn't help, and you need to go at an appropriate pace. Mm -hmm. So, for example, you wouldn't necessarily, OK, let's go right to the core of the trauma. <laughs> you wouldn't do that, because yeah. part of the part of it, as far as I see it, is that you're building up capacity, you're building up resilience. Mm -hmm. You're not just releasing trauma in the old how, you've actually got to build up the, the entirety of the being and the resilience, yeah. and that goes along step by step. So, um, it, 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 it's like flying a kite in a way, you're building yeah. up that resilience and at the same time allowing the trauma to release. So at a point where they start, if they're getting overwhelmed, you've got to back off. Yeah, sure. <laughs> you know, mm. and then, okay, talk about resources, um, earth under the feet, or, you know, you encourage mm. people then to, to build up a lot of resources. I mean, it's, mm. uh, it's really moved me listening to your story, um, how resilient you already were, you know, and how, how many resources you had mm -hmm. to draw from. Um, a lot of people obviously don't have resources or, you know, they're very cut off. So you need to build that up. You need to make them feel um, a sense of autonomy as well mm -hmm. in order to work. Yeah. yeah. I, think, and I think it's also about self-love. <laughs> it's about loving yourself. Mm -hmm. And, um, well, I was very fortunate. I think you're pretty fortunate. Too. <laughs> you're yeah. both very fortunate in having loving families, you know, yeah. to start with. I mean, we actually had good foundations in that sense. Mm. So, um, I mean, that helps That's a huge. Lot, really. That's absolutely yeah. huge. I mm. mean, one of the things that really, I think, going back to resources, is that one of my teachers mm. said to me, where do you place your security? Mm. <laughs> and I went, okay, where do I place my security? And it's obviously, security has to be in here. Mm. You have to be secure with yourself. Uh. So that was, <coughs> that is where the, the, the Tai Chi and th things like that come in mm. because you have that body awareness mm. and you're building an inner core strength that mm. makes you feel strong and you're in, you're in here, yeah. you're in this mm. being, yeah. mm. you're occupying this space yeah. and I think that's, uh, that's, that gives you resilience. Yeah, absolutely. You have about five mm. or six minutes left. And one of the things you, you, you guys were telling me at lunch is you do some work in prisons, which I found very interesting, where you're basically going in there and mm. telling your... Well, okay. just, just talk, talk us through what you do in prisons. Okay. Okay. Well, this is run by the Forgiveness Project, and, um, which is a powerful thing. <laughs> basically, it's people's it's stories. It's called the Forgiveness Project. It's called the Forgiveness Project. Mm. And I mean, it's not religious-based or anything, but it's about mm. um, exploring forgiveness. Um, and, um, I mean, it did start just with an exhibition of people's views on forgiveness, and there were people who had been through horrendous situations, but not only victims, but also perpetrators of violence. Mm. And that helped me hugely in my healing, because suddenly I was meeting these men who had been violent, and then they had changed. And I thought, to, have to know that that's possible mm. was wonderful. And out of that came this grassroots work in prisons. So um, people like us go in, who've been through and um, who've been victims, survivors, and we talk our story. And through the men and women hearing this, it's immediately, um, they cannot avoid it actually, they're put in touch with a victim face to face. And, um, 
and it can start this role of empathy happening and they can understand then a little bit what it's like to be in that role of a victim and and stop them wanting to actually aggress so much again and also actually a lot of them though have been traumatized themselves gone through a lot of abuse in their past yes. and so it, we also we go in with next offender and he talks about his way of well having been in prison but come out and and you know his ability of having taken that chance and and the choice of change and then they look at their own lives and they start seeing the trigger points of what, what led them to where they are oh, today absolutely. and realizing yes they have a choice mm. and um it's been incredibly moving because things have come out of that where they've actually managed to talk to parents that have abused them in the past or you know friends that have robbed them from all their money and things like that you know they've actually mm. connected by phones and things and and um and just again seeing this transformation happening and I'm, I think, you know, well, for me, I just, I just find it so inspiring. Mm. And it's, it's transformational and it's a bit like, it's, you know, it's taking something from the darkness of where we were and, and transforming it into, into the light. Okay. Well, I like that as an ending to that, <laughs> our little programme here. Mm. Darkness and transfer and transforming it into the light. Mm. Which, and you guys, you mm. have a very light energy for the heaviness you've been through. You <laughs> certainly radiate, as far as I'm concerned. Mm. So I'm going to thank you all for coming in and talking to us on Conscious TV. I'm going to show you guys' book again, which is The Sky is Always There, Surviving a Kidnap in Chetnia. And I'm going to thank everybody for watching Conscious TV. And just to explain again, this is the kind of a unofficial part to the programme we made earlier. So if you or interested in more to know about the story of Camilla and John, you can seek the programme out. Thank you. <laughs>